Welcome to another Forte Growth episode, where we interview people doing awesome things online. We go over their successes, insights, and any failures to keep you motivated and inspired. Sit back. Let's go. Welcome to the Forte Growth Podcast, home of Forte Analytica SEO services. Make sure you check out Gareth Boyd on Twitter and the Forte Analytica team. Do a digital PR and your guest posts and niche edits for you. We dive into a lot of different things today with Sammy Allerking. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sammy. He's been on a few different podcasts recently doing the rounds, but he owns upthegains.co.uk, a financial website in the UK. He's crushing it. He's going to say things a little differently than a lot of other traditional display affiliate websites. So we dive into things he's done regarding his knowledge panel in Google, how he's gone about doing that, which is quite interesting. And if any of you are looking to develop EAT on Google and, and that trust, follow what Sammy's doing there. Search up the games on Google and you'll see it for yourself. And you can kind of mimic that with your own websites. And we dive into a lot of stuff around YouTube, how he's doing his long form YouTube videos, his short form, how he's doing his other social channels, kind of expanding outside of just the website. And then we dive into the website itself, how he's doing his buyers guys, some unique things that he's doing there and testing with his roundup articles and just a whole lot of other stuff around websites and his online business. So sit back and enjoy. All right, welcome to the Forte Growth Podcast, where you can get all of your digital PR SEO services from Forte Analytica. But today, we have Sammy Allen King. Welcome, Sammy. Hey, James. How's it going, man? No, it's going well. It's going well. Sammy, you've been doing the podcast rounds. You've been on Twitter spaces. You've been doing a bit of everything. Owner of Up The Gains, which would actually have been an awesome fitness site name, to be honest, but you've turned it into a financial site. So don't give a brief background about yourself, Sammy, what, what you're doing, and is that the only thing you're doing? Well, the game is to make people financially fit, James. So, you know, we're, we're still crossing okay. over into the yeah, fitness nice. world. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. I've been a marketeer for nearly 15 years. I've been starting businesses since I was about 16, most of them failing or just basically allowing me to spend more money than I had or needed at those ages. So, yeah, I, I've grown mainly in the hospitality space, but also in the digital app space as well growing startups really from kind of ground zero, like ideas, me and the founder in a room, like how do we grow this business to multi-million pound business and done that a good few times. I really love the startup mentality, kind of that, you know, I was doing marketing, but I was also doing operations, sales and finance and HR when needed. You know, I, I absolutely love that kind of, that real kind of Com camaraderie that you get within a startup mm. and yeah since then i kind of realized that actually hospitality wasn't really what i loved doing and that hit me hard in covid and i'd been helping people with their personal finances outside of my day job and that had grown to quite a lot of people in a whatsapp group and then that whatsapp group grew even more during covid wow. and eventually it was like well have you not got anywhere to go guys and i was like you know wow we need to make a brand out of this so up the gains was born Oh, nice. Okay. I didn't realize it was born from basically a need, not just from you being like, I'm going to start a finance website. It's like, I actually <laughs> have a lot of people that need somewhere to learn the stuff. And obviously there's probably a lot more you can reach with your site. But I think what's interesting about your site, you're doing things that a lot of people aren't doing. I just search, if anyone's interested, just search up the games on Google and you'll see a knowledge panel on the side and you've got GMB map, you've got photos. I, I, I'm assuming that's your, is that your house or your office there? Mate, it's You've so got... weird. I don't know why. The last couple of weeks, it's just been doing that. It's like showing so the... What are the photos? Are they just... It's, it's showing like, because I live on a brand new estate. So it's showing yeah. the pictures of that the home provider had before, of the inside of the properties before they're built. It's so weird. I can't get it to change. I've I've requested well, changes on like five times. Extra, extra credibility, <laughs> I think. So you've got... <laughs> You've got the map, the photos, you've got reviews, phone number, opening hours, products, qu the qu question and answers. How did you get all of this to go as well? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who may be struggling through various updates and looking for ways to show Google our real business. Yeah. For me, GMB was like one of the first things that we did. And I, I, I just... I suppose because I wasn't an SEO, I just thought about like, what do I need from a, to create a real business? And I'm going to need a GMB to do that. You know, it's one of the first things that I do with any startup that we've ever created. It's like, we've got to be on the map essentially. And, you know, a Google owned product with a GMB is a, is a great place to start, especially if you're trying to grow authority in the eyes of Google, that you're actually a real person. 
So yeah, you as you touched on there, you know, we asked everybody mates going that, you know, basically according to a few people that I asked that are GMB experts, once you get past 20 reviews, that's a really good indication to Google that you're a real business. So we built 21 mm -hmm. reviews and stop there <laughs> but we, we're going to start redoing that now and rehashing that because uh, i also spoke to them recently and the importance of keeping that page up to date and that page is um is a little bit out of date so it needs to be kept up to date so we're going to be doing a big refresh on that and just adding stuff as we go but we add posts products everything in there because people will find you locally as well as finding you um, as well as google looking at your gmb listing and seeing your site and then seeing your site and hopefully you've got a good site and a good brand and then a lot of signal within to it and it's just one of many signals, but I, I'm a big fan of this. If Google own the products, then you should probably be on there in some capacity. Mm. Nice. So how did you, how did you get those reviews? Are they friends and family or are they people who have actually bought things yourself? So a couple are, yeah, a couple of, you know, 10 or so friends and family have to put in favors where you can. And then a lot of coaching clients and stuff I've sort of had along the way, I've sent links to and asked them for a review and. You know, they've very kindly gone to big lengths to put stuff up there. So yeah, I'm sure everyone's got 20 people that they can s send a link out to. But the most important thing, by the way, is don't do 20 of these reviews in one day and then do nothing else. That's a really bad signal. So you'll see that they're all split out over a number of months. And that was done on purpose. You know, I do two or three a month over a course of sort of six months or one a week is kind of fine. According to the experts, so you don't really want to be going any more than that because why would a brand new business have 20 people in one day, just randomly review them? It's, mm. it, it's a bad signal. So what else did you do? Like you said, the GMB, was there anything else after that you did, like put it on a bunch of directories, citations, things like that? Exactly right, man. Yeah. Your standard Yelps and, you know, yellow pages is Yelp, is Yelp these days, but anywhere that was like, you know, Hampshire business listings, all of these types of things for local, a lot of local stuff, a lot of UK stuff. And then. We put, you know, crunch base, all of those types of things that you can mm. get early, which are just showing you that you're a real person, making sure you've got your LinkedIn, that you're actually working for that brand and then linking back out of that brand and starting to do posts on LinkedIn about it, linking out from LinkedIn to you from the articles that you can write on LinkedIn. It's a great way of getting a few links and a few mentions up and running early. And then for us, it was really about building links into homepage as quickly as possible, really to just go and get, try and get a little bit of authority off the ground. You know, I think it's massively important, especially, well, to be honest, in any niche uh, homepage authority early on is, mm. is, 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 is a massive factor. So what are you doing now then for link building? So you've kind of built a lot of those homepage links initially. Are you now doing a lot of outreach, guest posting niche edits to edit pages? You're doing digital PR stuff that seems to be the big trend at the moment. What have you got going on? Shout out Gareth Boyd, Forte Analytica, of course, you know, he's, he's been a massive, massive help to us. I started with niche website builders back in the day. So James, I'm following you around everywhere, man. It's, yep. it's, it's getting a bit weird right now. You know, so, <laughs> um, I started with the digital PR back when niche website builders launched it and we had got some great results at first, but as we all know, it kind of tailed off a little bit mm -hmm. and, you know, we did end up. But really, when you worked it out, the amount of links that we got for what we paid kind of was respectable, really. And um, it was a great deal at, at the first thing. So we were building a lot of, you know, Sammy L. R. King, personal finance expert in the Metro, Telegraph, all of those sort of sites, which is, you know, a great signal. But we were also doing guest posts ourselves along the side of that. So contacting personal finance sites, there's great Facebook groups like UK Money Bloggers, et cetera, these types of groups where you can go and reach out to a load of sites on there and get yourself writing articles and that can kind of go into your more supporting pages. But I do feel like you should wait sort of six months before building any kind of links into support pages, because it's not really very natural and making sure that you've got at least a few articles within that cluster that are actually ranking, because why would you have links going into those pages otherwise? So, you know, try and make it as natural as possible and obviously internally link up into this, to the pages that you want to rank the big ones. You know, Charles Float put out something today, it's a topical map of link building and it's yeah. actually, he's so right, it's, it's, it's bang on, like building links into your sport pages rather than your money pages to boost those up is a, is a great way of, of, of getting traffic early on to these, these sort of big, you know, big pages that you really need to make revenue out of. Yeah. But before I dive into as well, more about your site, I think the listeners will be interested, quite interested in that too, but I want to know what else you're doing outside of just blogging and I know you have a podcast and YouTube you're pushing as well, but you can dive into that too. But what else are you doing outside of that regarding other areas of putting content? So socials, 
email, all that kind of stuff? It's a great question. So for me, building this as a marketeer, I look at the, every area where perhaps my audience might play. You know, blogging is one tiny sphere of marketing. And if you look at the whole sort of 360 approach, that's exactly where I'm going with this because James, I'm sure you, you know, you're reading stuff all day, but do you really enjoy reading blogs? Probably not. Like most people not like video these just days. Just having a video, video on in the background. Right, exactly, man. So, but some people love reading. I can't read anymore. I can't even read books anymore. It just, I just, my brain just doesn't compute it in the same way. I need to listen <laughs> or watch. And so what that's doing is then just completely discounting almost two thirds of an audience base in the way that they learn if you're only writing in blogs and trying to rank on Google. So I want to be able to basically give the same message, the same, let's say we're writing a an article about how to create a budget. The podcast could be about how to create a budget and so could the YouTube video too. It's exactly the same message. You're utilizing it in a different way in long form and short form content, which you can then put out on both many forms of social media, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, and then you can create long form content. So basically we create a, now we we're flipping this on its head. We create the long form content and then we create five or six shorts based on mm. the long form content. And that allows us to really kind of scale up. And we've got, you know, hundreds of YouTube scripts ready to go because we have 300 plus articles and, and we know which ones rank. So we focus on ones that we think might be cool to, to, to cover or indeed, you know, securing an article. If you suddenly got a great article, that's ranking one, two, three in Google, you don't have a video on it, but you, you're making YouTube content, go and make a video about it. Even if it's a four or five minute video and put it in the article right up the top, you know, we have it within the first sort of 10th of the entire article intro table of contents video. And that's a really great way of solidifying both time on page and equally as well, just your kind of spot in the, in the search. But yeah, going back to what I was saying about the ranking factors is, is, is again, if you're playing in multiple spheres, you've got different avenues of traffic. And I see the website as the central core of this brand. And then the YouTube really will kind of end up being its own core as well. But right now it's a supporting factor for the website. So is the podcast. And the social medias, they all lead in. If you imagine a bubble with kind of little lines going off and everything sort of leading into that one core product, which is the website, that's really what we do. Socials, email marketing, YouTube, podcasts, anywhere where our audience will be, we want to be. Yeah, I love that. How are you changing your articles into YouTube scripts? Because I'm assuming you can't just read your article as is as a YouTube video because people... Like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> this is, yeah. this is boring. It sounds like a blog. So how are you changing that script? Yeah, it's a great question. We take out the nuggets, you know, like what are the, the key stats? We did one the other day, which is actually our best performing one at the moment, which is what is a good salary in London. So we just took out the infographics because the infographics can go on the video. We then speak about the infographics and we follow exactly the same structure, but obviously, mm. you know, you, you want little hooks. And certain phrase in terms of phrase, when I'm talking to you and the way that I might write it, it's going to be very different. So yeah. I physically actually go and write that. I don't, I couldn't, can't use AI for this because it's not my personality. I really want that to shine through in these YouTube scripts. So you know, a lot of people turn them into chat GTP scripts and, you know, you'll get a good script back out of that. But as we've seen, and we start to use AI a lot more, it's very similar phrase terms of phrase which can become quite monotonous if you're hearing it the same, all of the same time. So for, for me, I just personally add my flavor. I go through that article and I pull the bits out and turn that into a YouTube script. And, you know, sometimes I'm spending one, two, three hours on a, on a YouTube script, especially if it's an important article and you kind of have to in finance, because if I get one figure wrong, trust me, someone on YouTube will find that comment and, the, <laughs> and, and, and they will go to town on you and they will say, you know, I had it the other day, had seven ways to do something. And on the sixth one, I said that it was number five again for the second time. And man, yeah. like five, six people within 30 minutes of it being live was you, you didn't say it correctly. And so they'll tell you. So and in finance, man, you can't be playing that game, especially with people's money. So you've got to take some time to, <laughs> to, to, yeah, to, to check yourself before you riggedy wreck yourself, as they might say. So. So are you reading, are you reading the script word for word then in your video? Yeah. So we use a teleprompter. It's taken some refining, man. I mean, we, we got like 
the first few videos that we did were absolutely dog shit because it's just yeah, they were like they were so bad because I was looking left and right, but then luckily V.io is is a cool little video um, video editing software, but it has AI um I I software, so you, it makes you look at the camera even if you're not looking at the camera, which Whoa. is scary. And it's it's really it's... cheap, and but it makes my eyes look quite big. Um, my girlfriend said that she quite likes it, so yeah, I might have to roll with it. Yeah, so the videos that we were creating at the start were, were were dreadful, and I was trying to learn it line for line and then do it. And then, you know, I was just like, you know what, fifty quid for a teleprompter off Amazon, and the apps are about twenty quid a year, and I can get the words going right down the middle of the camera lens, and I can then start to deliver that. And I feel like my performances are getting better and better and better as I'm going now. I'm way more relaxed. I'm not like doing some weird little high pitch voice that I was doing at the start, really trying to put a lot of energy into it, which I'm sure we can all speak for when you start making YouTube videos, man. It's an experience for sure. Dude, it's, it's hard and it's a grind. I'm, I'm the opposite to you though. I can't, I can't do a script. I, I cannot, I cannot read off something while I do a YouTube video. I have, I might have some points written down beforehand, but they won't be anywhere near me. And I just look at the camera and I just talk about the topic. I don't even think beforehand, you know, I just like, this is the topic. Okay. I'm going to talk somewhat on that. And then I'll just talk and whatever comes out, comes out. And that's as, that's as far as I go. I just can't, I can't bring myself to script it, plan it like too much time. And when it's scripted, I just can't, it's almost like I can't deviate from what's on there. Yeah. And it makes yeah. it very, very hard for me. So I'm sure there's people listening. I do that little things like, like, um, I put like a riff in big, bold words and brackets. Cause I know that oh, I'm yeah. going to go and say something and then I try and bring that back. And the beauty of that, of, of editing is that, you know, I can mess that up five, six times, but there'll be chunks out there. And luckily my editor, who's amazing off Fiverr for, for very cheap as well, he, you know, he, he manages to make it look like it, there was nothing wrong. But if you saw the unedited version, you'd be like, how on earth is he going to make this work? But yeah, no, I, I don't know how you do it, man. Honestly, I lose myself completely. So teach me your ways because I'd, I'd love to make it less like that, but it is what it is. I have no ways. It's probably more laziness, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can just talk, like, sometimes I'll do like, if I don't have a guest, I think this week I'm going to do a solo podcast for one of my things just because. Yeah, like last week, my shitty tongue also meant I had to move on my podcast like this one to today, but I might just do a solo one. I mean, I did a solo one a few months back and I did like 40 minutes just talking into the camera with no notes, nothing. Nice. I think it's, I think once you start writing enough content too, is so much in your brain from writing and researching that you kind of just start to regurgitate shit and then your own experiences on top of it yeah. makes it a little easier. But you mentioned obviously you have your five editor for some of those things. So how, how big is your team? Cause it sounds like if you're writing content, writing YouTube scripts and filming them, that's already a lot on your plate. And you've, then you've got to edit and post shorts for Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and everything else. I tried to, I was using opus.clip, the AI video nice. editor for the shorts. And I was like, okay, I'll schedule the entire week every Sunday. I did it for like two weeks. I was like, holy shit, man. That's just like, it takes so long to <laughs> schedule Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, Twitter, all four. Even though you're doing the same video on each day, but then, you know, sometimes, yeah, oh man, it's just a, a pain in the ass. So how are you navigating all that? It's a great question. I, I'm getting better at this, but i um, really trying to schedule my time so I know what I'm doing and I give myself two or three big tasks a day to go and do. And if I manage to get rid of those, then they're fantastic. But like, for example, with a YouTube script or a YouTube video, I'll do a recording day. so. I'll change my t-shirt two, three times just for each video, for example, but I'm still recording at that same time. Like the other day I did four and then, mm -hmm. you know, I have to cut those up a little bit and, you know, add the images and the, the B roll to the scripts that I, where I want them for the, for the editor and send that over. So, you know, I know recording day post production day, which is me getting the videos ready for the editor. I know that that's four. YouTube videos, I'm only putting that out for a week. So I'm doing that once a month. So that's two days per month, if you see what I mean. Mm. And then in my shorts day, I'll record 25 shorts and I'll just change the camera angle and take my top off. Uh, uh, hey, 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 no, too early for that. <laughs> I knew no, it was a fitness <laughs> site. <laughs> <laughs> I've not got guns like you, mate. I'm going to tell you. Uh, yeah. You know, like I, I'll just change things around. I'll do batches of five in that t-shirt. So, you know, I've got different content coming out 
at different times, but people don't know that, you know, it's actually one or two days a month we're recording for, and then everything else is done and my editor will send it back in batches essentially. And to talk to about your team, I have one full-time VA. The editor might as well be part of the team because I'm pretty much sending so much of work. He's busy with my stuff. I'm, I imagine he's doing one or two days a week with me at the moment, the amount I'm sending him, but you know, he's 34 pounds for a YouTube video, which can be up to 15 minutes. And he, that's damn good. He's good. Yeah, it's good. And his ratings are insane. You know, he's got the hundreds of thousands of reviews on Fiverr and he doesn't put his prices up. I hope he doesn't listen to this. And he's per shorts. It's for up to a 60 second short, properly edited. Maybe take it can either be taken from the YouTube video or, or pre recorded, which he then cuts up is four pounds for a, a short. So, you know, you can do, I can knock out, you know, a good month's worth of content for 80, 90 quid. Um, and I've got 25 shorts and, you know, four YouTube videos. So it's under 200 pounds. I've got like a YouTube editor, which is pretty good. That is, that's now. a very great deal. Yeah, that's, that's a very great deal. I mean, obviously hit and miss depending on what you find on there, but it sounds like you found yeah. a, a solid editor doing that. Now that's awesome. Around the shorts as well. So you're filming all your shorts. And you you mentioned you're cutting some of your long form into shorts. Is that mm. a, a prevalent thing that you do, or is it mainly you film the shorts independently? And why do you film your shorts independently versus just repurposing your long form content? I think there's different spheres of content really there. Like, yes, you know, taking some of your, uh, we take one or two per YouTube video. So a key bit of that video, we will then repurpose into a short, which actually the purpose of that one is for YouTube to then link back out in the related video section of that, of that short. We've only just started doing that though. And before we were really just filming just short form content, really just because the thing is one of these, I've had one on TikTok recently go to 180,000 visit Holy views shit. and then another one the other day, 18,000 and the rest of them are like four, five, 600 plays. So it just takes one and we went from 200 followers to 900 followers and that's what can happen. And it just takes one or two more of those. I've watched a number of creators, especially right now on Instagram, especially the algorithm is favoring reels. If you get one go absolutely wild, there was a girl the other day talking about the three tax think three things she could save on UK tax. She went to 1.7 million views. She started the video at 3000 followers. She's now on 94,000 followers. If Jeez. that then happens to me, if I get one of those, then that's it. My business is, my business will literally probably double overnight because I can then start sending traffic from the stories into affiliate pages and articles and just print money based on what we're saying. And also for my, um, newsletter and my, you know, and the digital products it's the sales will go through the roof. So that's the strategy. We want one, two, three viral videos over the next sort of three to six months and we'll be in a very, very different position. So, and it just all feeds into each other. So that's the strategy at the moment. I love that, man. But did you notice anything different with the video that went viral versus the ones that aren't? No, weirdly. Well, it was me interviewing a blonde girl, should we say, <laughs> and she's in the finance industry and she was talking about a product, which is quite hot right now in the UK, which is a lifetime ISA. And it's basically a way for young people to save money for a house. So, you know, quite a hot topic across the world, really anyway. And, you know, I think she just explained it very well. And I was sort of reacting and asking questions to her for, it was a podcast clip and it just blew. And that's another thing with podcasts, especially with the video podcasts, you know, we take one or two clips a week and we, we put those on on Instagram and TikTok and they do okay. But then that one just went wild. So I don't know whether it was like, you know, they like the look of me or her, probably her, but <laughs> it was, you know, that's just, you know, that's just the way it is. It's very difficult to put a finger on it. But then I had a video the other day, which was just me talking. I was quite bullshit in what I was saying. I was basically saying that you won't retire early. And if you keep doing this and, you know, a bit of negativity and a bit of like, and the comments went absolutely wild. People basically throwing their shit out of the prams, like calling me Satan and all this type of stuff. But it's like, okay, cool. You know, you don't get it. That's fine. I'm not here to please everybody, but I'll take the yeah. 18,000 views and the couple hundred followers that, that, got, that yeah. come off it. Yeah. Engagement is engagement. You mentioned, obviously you're filming 25 shorts in a day, which is mm. damn, it's a lot of shorts, but I don't know if I could do that. I have to try it sometime, but are you scripting all your shorts? Cause I'm assuming you script those yeah. 
two. The question is around the shot. Like shots are typically like punchy, like kind of like reels, you know, fast cuts, lots exactly. of quick animation and things like that. So how are you planning that with an exam? I'm assuming, are you just talking for a minute and say that everything gets edited in with the cuts and stuff and maybe the zoom in, zoom out, or are you actually like moving places, doing different things, et cetera, with your shorts? That's the next phase for me. At the moment, I'm just straight piece the camera. But within that, it will have like em bits that we emphasize or it will have infographics or a picture or a bit of B-roll come in to break up the footage. And we know what that is before we do the video. But at the moment, we just started. We've I've basically been working quite closely with this guy called Rico. And he's been really teaching me how to write like unbelievable hooks. He took his, he's well, he's actually taken multiple channels now from zero to like hundreds of thousands of followers. And he, he bases all of his mantra on the hook. Um, because these algorithms, if you watch past the first 10 seconds, they deem that a successful video, whether or not the content is any good or not, because they obviously can't yeah. check up on the content. So your watch time now is what's important. The likes and the comments and the saves. Yes, they're, they're still a factor, but actually the watch time, keeping people on app, if you look now on the back end on the insights, there's watch time and retention yeah. rates and graphs, which you can see. So your idea is to try and keep your retention rate as high as possible. Now you do that through a hook and that can be as simple as imagine I said X, Y, and Z, or most people that are like this think like this, or, you know, there's loads of them. I basically got a whole 30, 40 hook bank, which I can then feed different oh, X, nice. X and Y, Z topics into. And actually writing the video after making that, because you're already like, you've already got like a kind of a, a semi-controversial or at least a sort of tailored hook and trying to keep it very, very snappy. Every word and every line matters in those shorts because the retention span of these people are so short. So if you and can't get or the delivery isn't correct, then it, they, people can turn off extremely quickly and that's not what you're aiming to do. Yeah, that's something I'm trying to do with some of my YouTube videos. I don't always do it just because it's hard. Like for example, Jake Thomas's creator hooks nice. platform where he's basically based on all the different titles and stuff he's going to do while well, he has them all in a, in a database there. And going through there, if I look at the titles and I try to find a title before I do a video, then it tends to as you mentioned, you have the, basically that makes your video versus sitting there being like, what am I going to do a video on? I could do a video on this stuff. Mm. And then what am I going to title it? And then you got to try and figure out a clickbaity title for it versus going the other way, starting with the title and then making the yeah. video. But obviously that's a different way. So are you, are you ever targeting keywords and stuff on YouTube or are you just going for something that's going to hopefully clickbait and then be more on the suggested browse page? Yeah, so it's something I'm learning a lot about recently, and actually it's super interesting. I use vidIQ, which is basically a YouTube SEO tool, and you can search by keyword and related phrases and questions, etc. And we craft now, you know, I might come up with a video about, I don't know, budgeting, let's say again, because everybody understands it, but it might be eight bad budgeting hacks that 20 year olds never should do or whatever. Yeah. And I would never have found that without that. And actually you can see search volume and competition based on how many subscribers you've got. And it actually looks at your channel and says whether or not it thinks you can rank for that, which is interesting. It's too early for me to give any data on this, but I've seen videos like some of the reviews go on to page one. I would have written the title completely differently and we've gone on page one on YouTube search. So it can, I think I wouldn't have got there without that. So there's certainly that play and I'm very interested in exploring it because if you look at your Ali Abdals and your, you know, your Zanes, et cetera, they, they all bang on about using TubeBuddy or vidIQ as their kind of backend system. Mm. And that's where they find a lot of their trending videos is, is using that software. And so, yeah, I think it's important, you know, we all know that YouTube search is a, is a real thing. So we've got to optimize for that too. Nice. I want to come back to your website. We haven't let you touch too much on the website itself. And yeah, yeah. how does your site make money? Is it just display at affiliate or you got more going on? Yeah. Digital products is the third stream. So yeah, there's really just those three at the moment. We do obviously sell placements as well. One of our main revenue drivers last month was us selling a spot on the best investing apps page. And mm -hmm. the brand just wants to burn through some sort of VC cash and get themselves some quick wins. And that's getting on, you know, the best investing apps page or on a bunch of websites, they'll pay to be the top spot. And that's a really lucrative 
way of things because it, well, it was mm-hmm. me moving a box from you know number four to number one. <laughs> I still get the CPA, and it's they're paying four figures to be in that spot for 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 three months. And it, if you have multiple best of pages, you can charge per page. And you know if this works out with this brand, they they've just got you know over a hundred million pounds in funding up for taking some of that cash, and they want a sponsored review as well now, so they're happy to pay for that. They're paying five six hundred pounds, which is sort of seven eight hundred yeah. pa- dollars just for that review. And that's just great money for me because I can sort of just put that out. And as long as they still give me a CPA, I'm like more than happy to, to, to do that. I do that as well a lot with the guys that I know that don't get a lot of search volume. So like, you know, let's say there's a brand in the industry that you know in your niche that comes and asks you for a review. You know, you're not going to get a lot of traffic for that. So why dedicate your time to it and tell them that and be really upfront. Just be like, I'm not sure this is going to get a load of search traffic just based on how big you guys are as a brand. but. If there was some budget, i.e. some money, then, you know, that might change the way I think kind of thing. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good way of looking about it. What do you do or what would you do then if this company sponsors the number one spot for three months and it converts really well, and then they decide they don't want to keep sponsoring. Do you still keep them there at number one? Yeah. Look, it's a brand play at the end of the day. If people are enjoying them, um, especially within finance, you've got to be careful with, there's got to be trust factors at play here. You know, yeah. if this brand came and and said, hello, yeah, I want to come to number one, but I go on their trust pilot and they've got 2.1 stars and a shitload of people telling me that, you know, that they're awful run for the hills. Yeah. I won't take the money no matter what they offer me unless it's, you know, million quid and then, you know, happy days. But it's even then it's going to be very, very difficult for me to then, if I break the trust with my customer base, then I'm not doing right by myself as a brand builder and I have a responsibility to them and their wallets at the end of the day. And that's worth more than the you know, a couple of grand that someone might throw at you for, for a spot there. So we do very much check that, but yeah, you're right. A hundred percent, man. If it starts converting well and the CPA is good, then yeah, absolutely. We'll keep them there. Nice. And then your, I guess your content strategy now, what are you currently working towards? Are you trying to put up more affiliate style content to boost your revenue or are you looking at more uh, informational content to bring people to digital products pages? Is there anything you're focusing on? We've slowed down a lot. You know, we went on a ridiculous content drive for the first sort of 18 months. We're still sort of putting out one, two posts a week, but we're really trying to, to go back through and optimize what we've got because we've, we've probably got about 50 plus reviews and maybe, yeah, I'm saying about 15 best of pages and these best of pages in finance are massive, you know, six, six, 7,000 words. They're huge. So. We want to optimize those to the highest degree and get ourselves ranking for some of these a bit higher because that's where the money is. And I work very closely with Jamie IF on that. And I thank him for his work and some of the money that he's put in my pocket just from his spear framework. It's a fantastic way of really gaining trust to the user. I would really recommend people check that out. It really does work. Do you want to maybe just briefly break that down for the listeners? Just for God, I'll do an absolute hash job of it. I think basically what you're trying to do is essentially make the user trust you and your recommendation very quickly. So the opening part of the article, the intro is what Jamie focuses on. And the first line is, and you're giving value judgment early and a reason for them to trust you and a reason why they know that you know that this is the best product for that person. And you're also trying to disqualify people too. So this is right for you if you're X, Y, and Z person. But if you're this type of person, then this is right for you. You can do that in finance very, very easily. You know, if you're a seasoned investor, then this app is right for you because it has way more technical features, which you're going to want. But if you're a beginner, you're going to want this type of app because you don't want the technical aspects of it. And you actually want to try and have a little bit of fun and learn. So they, they have a great academy, for example. So you're really trying to show that you care about the person that's reading that article. And you do that in the top 10th of that page. But equally at multiple points throughout it as well. So if you've got a top 10 listings page, then you're going to want to make value judgments all the way through that article. Are you doing anything maybe you would deem unique or different on your, maybe those big roundup pages that others aren't? Like, for example, I see a lot of, or some pages now, they'll have the intro, they might have like the tops. In fact, a lot of them don't even have the top three table anymore that I see. They do intro and then they'll literally list, say, for example, best investing apps and I'll have bullet points, best investing app, hyperlink, best investing app for beginners, hyperlink, best investing app for whatever, blah, blah. And then they might even have a table that has all of the investing apps and then 
kind of a ranked score for each thing, you know, usability, I found it a price, et cetera, and kind of rank and have everything in one and then start going through reviews. Is that something that you've done, looked into? Do you do something different, similar? How do you go about it? Yeah. So we're testing this at the moment in quite a, you know, A and B vape, but testing essentially mm. whether or not the comparison table should be underneath all of the app listings, above the app listings. Does it help? Does it not? What's the conversion rates if I move this here? So we do exactly that. We have a bulky intro, which gives the value judgment. It's not especially on the best of pages, you can't really have the one, two, three lines that you would get in a blog post because people are there for a value decision. They're ready to buy. So they're thinking of buying. So you need to try and make sure that you kind of get them on board early. So a very good intro. Then usually what we'll do is we will give them the ability to drop down to a certain section or a certain app if they like the look of that. Mm. So if they click that button, it will zoom right down to the full listing of that app. Also, we will have a comparison table, then a bullet pointed list or the yep. other way around. So we're testing them and then we'll go into the big value judgments after that. But we're trying to work out what is working and ev we've got it running slightly different on a few different pages and we're just seeing how people are interacting with that. But that's something that, that Jamie is very good at and that he's kind of put into place for us. You know, this was something that I was just creating an intro with a few listings underneath and doing that praying people would come, but I knew that there was so much more to it. And that's why I sort of took the decision to work with Jamie because he's got such great results in that area. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because yeah, I'm seeing almost, well, maybe I'm seeing like less of those comparison tables initially, with like, you know, the three best picks. I mean, I still do it with yeah. the three best picks. It's just kind of how I have it there, but seeing less of that now, I'm just seeing more of like literally listing every single thing that's probably yeah. within the article and then it, you know, going down that way, which is interesting. I don't know if it converts use, better or not. We're using Lasso mm -hmm. to, to deliver that at the moment because they've got some fantastic software that allows you to be able to get across key information and star ratings. And this is best start for beginners, best for seasoned investors, et cetera, in a very nice format. So you can do a, you know, top three listings uh, mm -hmm. in a, in a vertical table very, very quickly. And it looks great and it works on mobile and it makes a lot of sense to do that. And then underneath that you then, so you've got value judgment, top three listings all of the listings and their best yeah. for and what they're listing for then comparison table and then you they only then are you then going into the full mm. listing of the brand like so it. they've got like three they've got a this is the top three sometimes in some cases top two because you don't need to give more than that yeah. and then full amounts it's, there could be 10 apps on there yeah. often i don't really add more than six or seven because who needs more than six or seven investing apps so yeah, that's the thing. So it really depends per page and what we're talking about. Yeah, I like that. And then when you're explaining, say, the buyer's guy section, you know, how to pick the best investing app and you kind of go all sorts of different things or how you picked the best investing apps for this roundup, are you placing it after all of the products or are you doing the beforehand, like this is how we pick the best apps? Yeah, so at the moment we, we have it at the bottom. So what we actually do with the buyer's guides is we have a six pillar system. We call it a six pillar system. We're trying to basically say that it's ours. Basically anyone can use it. It's, it's essentially just a, just a way of ranking, but it's the way I rank in the single reviews. I use the six pillar system, which is, you know, suitability for beginners, useful features, these types of things that are important for any type of financial app, whether you're Tom, Dick, Harry, whether you're a savings app, investing app, a make money online app, it doesn't matter. These six factors are really important. And then, so we, we use that as the buyer's guide. And then we give a winner per value judgment, which might be a bit different to the other one. So what's the best for usability features, which is the best for beginners, which has the best customer service, which has the best customer reviews. And that might actually be different to the value judgment you've given right at the top. So again, it's just another, if they've gone past all of the listings and they still haven't made a decision and they get to that point, I'm not then losing them in a walls of text that which are underneath that, which you need to rank on these finance pages because best investing apps page, you know, if you look at everyone that's ranking, it's like, what is investing? Why should I invest? How much should I yeah. invest? And there's so much text that goes underneath these types of things. And if someone gets to that point, it's very hard to get them back up to to start buying. So you've got to have these little junctions of affiliate clicks or even the ability to jump page back to the app. Um, mm. so yeah, that's what we d we're doing at the moment. Hopefully it pays off. I like that. Are you still adding the frequently asked questions portion, even though Google's like, yeah, we're not going to give that to you anymore. We're still getting them. I don't yeah. know whether okay. or not 
like we shouldn't be or we, <laughs> we might get a hit for this, but we still had the FAQ schema and new articles that have gone up have had the FAQ showing on the listings. So if that gets turned off, that gets turned off. But I personally add FAQs to every single article because it's where I put the questions that I don't really want to talk about, but are important for the page mm -hmm. on ranking factors. And it's basically where you just shove everything that you couldn't really talk about in the article or the variations of, that people of the keyword that people can't really talk about in the article because it is SEO heavy. Are you adding that to informational articles then too, or just the hundred percent buyer intent stuff? Yeah, yeah, we do it on everything. It's really great way of just answering tons of questions and variations of questions that may come up with that topic. Are you just getting the FAQs from the people also asked and kind of long tail keywords you can get from a bunch of different tools? So the way we look at FAQs is yes, people are, are also asked is a great way. We use answer the public. We go into the top three, actually top five. I open up the tabs and I go through them and any questions that I've not, I've got and it, and they've, they've got that they may write in a different way that I will then include those in my FAQs. And we usually come out with five or six and then, you know, I wrote an article the other day and it was, you know, should Bitcoin be included in my ISA, for example, I'm never going to put that in the article because I don't really like yeah. talking about cryptocurrency, but it's in all of the top three articles, they've got it. They've got that question. So I'm not going to miss that out. So I put it in the FAQs yeah. just so we're still covering that. And that's how I feel like I said, you know, I take two or three questions from the people I also ask, maybe if there's an absolute banger from ask the public also chat GPT, if you're struggling for them. Or for extra ideas, it's a great way. Like what are some questions people might be answering this topic and actually get some bangers come out of it that have really helped us rank before we've won quite a few featured snippets based on chat GPT's answers. So yeah, always, always just use avenues and then just hand select the six that you think you're probably going to need most. So how deep are you going on these, on these buyers guys? You say you have best investing apps. You've got all the different apps. You've got best for beginners, best for whatever seasoned investors. Are you going out and you writing roundups for all the long tails, like best investing as for beginners? That's a separate one that kind of links back. Are you also writing individual reviews that also link back to these pages? How deep are you going? Pretty deep, dude. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the best investing apps is the holy grail of the site. Like it's always going to be, you know, if we, one, if we get that ranking on its own, we've done a very good job, but every single investing apps review will link back to the best thing about apps page, because it makes sense for it to mm -hmm. in terms of a topical map, but also equally all of the supporting articles, which are talking about investing will link to best investing apps or best stocks and shares ISA, or best pensions or any, anything, what well, mainly most of these three pillars really of the site, because it will make sense to, so yeah, we internally link back up to everything and. All of the articles, you got to have your pillars and your money pages yeah. and then underneath this, you know, your tier one supporting pages and then your tier two supporting pages, which are, are bolstering all, all two of those. And that's something that, you know, I try to map out in my head as much as possible before we do these things. But as we all know, we end up just getting words on paper and then try and, and internally link back up. You know, anyone yeah. going further than that has got way more time on their hands than they, than they should. So. <laughs> No, no, for sure. Are you, are you exact match internally linking all the time or are you purposefully trying to do variations? That's a great question, man. I'm, his name always escapes me, but he was on the Niche Pursuits podcast. I will try and dig it out for you, James, so you can link to it in the, in the description because it is amazing. I think he was ex Moz, if I'm not mistaken, but he's in, he did this study and he did it around anchor variations. And basically the premise of it was, he was saying that you could was do it, one. Was it Cyrus Shepard? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. He's on the pod. I oh, wow. Week. There you go. I'd be interested <laughs> to hear what he's still saying about this. That's, that's very interesting. I'll definitely be tuning into that episode for sure, because I based my entire internal linking strategy based on his data studies. You know, he was looking <laughs> over a million sites and he came back with the fact that essentially one or two exact max anchor text is is fine but then you should start looking at variations because essentially they're i probably hashed this completely up but essentially they're variations of that keyword so you sh from, from a google's perspective if you want to rank you know if i'm writing best investing apps you know best investing apps 2023 or investing apps in the uk right now or these uh, you know these are very bad variations but they're still the same thing yeah. that people might maybe typing into Google. So they're just slight variations of the main keyword. 
and it served us very well so far. And I just feel like it makes a little bit more of a better map for the site and gives you more opportunities to rank for those keywords because they're looking at those anchor texts and going, oh, well, that's very important to this page for a reason. It's funny, I, I pretty much do the opposite. I kind of follow Clint Butler with his advice on not just internal link, but just backlinks and internal link in general, where he's hard on, I guess you're, I could bring him back on the pod. I've already talked to him, I'm going to bring him back on, but he's actually, awesome. your anchor, yeah, your anchor text is the relevancy. And then obviously if you're talking about backlinks, obviously authoritativeness is, is whatever's on the off page factors on that site and et cetera, and on page factors on that site, but the anchor text is the relevancy and that is all that matters. So he's just like, he exact matches everything he can because that really? is the relevant term that he wants. And then once that stops ranking that page, then he might start looking at variations. And I really like that idea of that anchor text is the relevancy that you're going after for that page. So, I mean, shit, there's so many different ways of doing things. Everyone's got different theories on it, but. To, to be honest you know. with you, it just all blows my mind. I think for us, it, I was like, well, you know, there are so many different ways of saying the same thing. If I'm saying it so many times over, is that natural? I don't know. Yeah. So. For me, I was just trying to base it off like if I was talking to a person, the amount of times I'm going to change my turn of phrase to say the same exact thing will change a lot. So mm. that's way more natural in terms of a language perspective. So I just felt like that approach maybe was 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 correct. And look, if there's data showing against it, you know, I've got a lot of work to do on my <laughs> internal maps, essentially. So yeah, hey, we'll I don't see. know. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. But as well, along that. Do you ever then internally link, for example, when you say, hey, you can read about more about this here and you link, read more about this here. There's obviously a lot of, I guess you say mummy bloggers and stuff that kind of would do, if you weren't focused on SEO, that's what you'd, I mean, that's what I used to do back in the day. Yeah. yeah. You can read about more here, you know, is that something you would ever do because it is looking more natural? Yeah. I mean, we've done it for sure. And we have it on the site. I haven't done it for a long time now. I will put. Check out our guide on X rather than writing, you know, read here to find out about X and then putting that in there. I just, I, again, I, I kind of, it's that mummy blogger approach, which has not fed so many mummy bloggers so well that I just felt like it wasn't as natural as you find it. But then you do see it in some of the bigger publications. They'll put mm. that as their anchor text. So. You know, who's right here and who's wrong? Who who knows? I mean, I am not an internal and linking expert, so I cannot give speak for what is right or what is wrong. I can only say what we're doing and um, yeah. we seem to be getting some results for it. You know, whether there's a better practice, I am all ears. And so definitely we'll be tuning into Silas to hear what he's got to say. You know, perfect. And yeah, you're doing an awesome job with Up The Gains currently, but where can people find you, Sammy, and follow what you're doing? Yeah, thanks, James. Upthegains.co.uk is the website if anybody wants to come check us out. And we're on every single social platform going Shit. at Up The Gains Money. So yeah, please do come and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to get us monetized like in the next 30 days. So it will definitely help. And just basically leave the podcast on which because they're hour long episodes. So just watch every single one of them, even, <laughs> even if they're on mute on another screen. I don't care. So yeah, do that, please. <laughs> Dude, the monetization grind on YouTube is the biggest grind. I swear. I'm still I'm still pushing hard on mine. Even though my second channel might which I started like a month and a half or two months ago, might beat my main one to monetization. It's just like, dude, everything about it is a grind with YouTube. It is so I'm like halfway hard. there. So I'm like yep. seven hundred subscribers and two and a half thousand watch hours now. So we're getting there. It's just going up and up and up and up and up. And then I watch it every day. I'm like, yes, 30 hours. And the thing moves like the tiniest little, tiniest thing. You're yeah. like, oh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but, you know, I'm in the finance space, for me, once I'm monetized, you know, the CPMs on that are like 12, 13 pounds. Yeah, that's true. That's going to be like really, really great base of revenue for us as soon as we're monetized. Yeah, it's a big, big, big goal for us. So please do come watch all of our YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll link it all down the description too. But thanks for coming on, Sammy. I appreciate it. Thanks, James. Appreciate it, man.